Okay, so I, I'm happy to be here. I welcome you to the presentation Build a Pump Monitor for Railway Applications with Zephyros. My name is Oliver Völkers. I'm here together with uh, Jonas Remmert, and together we will make this presentation. I will introduce you to the Pump Monitor project and will explain uh, or I will handle the question, can artificial intelligence recognize the wastewater flow, which is a, quite an interesting question, as we will see. And in the second part, Jonas will give an overview uh, over the firmware that we developed together and explain the power management and what we learned from it. And we, if we have some time left, then we can take some questions from the audience. If you have a really urgent question, then just uh, ask in between. <coughs> Okay, so what is the task? Uh, you might have heard about the ICE trains, the Intercity Express trains from Deutsche Bahn. And if you travel with them regularly, then you have experienced the sign as you can see on the photo. And so sometimes the toilets in the ICE trains are out of order. And why is this the case? And of course the toilet might be dirty, but in that case it can easily be resolved. And Quite often, the reason is that the wastewater tank is full. And it is full because it was not properly emptied before. So there would be an overflow, and to avoid an overflow, it's shut down. So the reason why the tanks are full is that pump failures go unnoticed. And when the train is traveling, then it's too late to fix the toilet. So our task that Deutsche, Bank, Deutsche Bahn had for us was to develop a system that monitors the wastewater pump uh, automatically and reliably. So it should work fully automatically and of course it uh, needs to work reliably because otherwise it doesn't make sense to monitor the quality. So how does it look like? On the photo you can see an ICE train with a magnified uh, part of it where you can see a part of the tank with a pipe from the pump and the little black box there is a module that we have built from Berliner Sensor Technik and this little box with a LED in this case a green LED indicating that everything is fine that is our product that we developed and that's what I'm talking about <clears throat> so the challenge in this case is uh, that we had no energy supply no wired connection, no gateway, almost nothing because it has to work independently for safety reasons. The only connection is via mobile radio and the whole system is battery powered. So this changes everything because if it's battery powered it means that everything has to be extremely energy sufficient. Now first we thought we could use a conventional flow meter because there are lots of flow meters available in the industry for liquids. They work very well generally. However, in this case with wastewater, they cannot differentiate between an empty pipe and blockage. And this, uh, makes, uh, uh, this gives a real challenge because an empty pipe is okay, a blockage of course is not okay. But in both cases, there is no flow. And wastewater is something that conventional flow meters cannot easily uh, detect because it's variable, it's a solid, liquid, and gas, and they are mixed, mixed just such as foam. So if you have water with bubbles, is that a liquid? Is it not a liquid? It depends. And that's quite complex. So from a scientific perspective, it's quite an interesting matter. In order to indicate that, or in order to detect the flow, we have built a hybrid sensor system with pressure, vibration, temperature, humidity sensors, which all work together. On the di diagram, you can see the, uh, the pressure sensor and the flow of the, 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 flow of the uh, water uh, over time. Now, why do we use Zephyros? That's, after all, that's why we are speaking here at the conference. You probably all know bare metal programming, usually with C on a microcontroller. In this case, it would be 
are not capable enough because we have multitasking, we have requirements for real-time operation and it needs to be energy saving. And if you have multiple sensors working at the same time, then um, bare metal programming is simply not sufficient. On the other hand, a full PC operating system such as Linux would be too large and it would use too much energy, uh, too much memory and so on. And Zephyr our TOS is actually exactly the right size as it turned out. Another reason why we are happy to use Zephyr OS is that we are using the Nordic Semiconductor NRF 9160 microcontroller, which is very capable because it combines an ARM microcontroller with an LTE and NBIoT modem, wireless modem, in one unit. And that is very capable and also energy saving. <coughs> and Nordic Semiconductor has an SDK, software development kit, which is based on Zephyr. So it was the obvious choice for this project. Another reason is uh, to have, um, another positive reason for Zephyr is that it's open source, which is a really strong argument if you build an embedded project because you can have later, you can have access to the source code, you can debug it, you can uh, make service, you can handle security or safety uh, issues and all that. So open source was a strong argument in favor of Zephyr when we worked with this for Deutsche Bahn. Now, what have we built after about uh, three years, we developed a monitoring system that detects and reports failures automatically. So it works and it really works the way it should. The result now is that we have a series of uh, 36 modules in 24-7 operation. So they work night and day continuously for over one year. There are no serviceable parts from the outside, no buttons. Nobody has to switch them on because everything is automatic. And over the time, we have more than 50,000 wastewater deposit deposits which are analyzed and uh, where a protocol has been sent wirelessly with an un unambiguous detection of any issues. So we both send a protocol when everything is fine, but also we give an alert when there is a failure. And you can see in the middle, uh, this is an MQTT report with uh, in JSON format, so it's a very short, like a telegram, which reports every uh, wastewater service. Now, the architecture of the network, network is um, the obvious choice would be cloud computing for most people. Cloud computing is something that everybody knows. Uh, cloud computing has the advantage that it requires only simple nodes. All data are collected into the cloud, so everything is in the cloud. And you have a powerful central processing. However, everything must be online it, and it must be always online. It only works as long as you have access to the network. And if you don't have access to the network or to the cloud, then you're out of luck. And in this case, with a real world railway application, you cannot be sure that the network is always up. And if the network is not running, then uh, the trains could not be serviced, which would be unacceptable. So that is why we are using edge computing. Edge computing in this case means that processing is performed locally. It works independently from any central computer or a central network, which keeps the traffic low. It can handle interrupted connections. So even if there is no network at all, everything still works. And then with a delay, uh, the data will be sent. So the protocol will be sent uh, when the network is up again or when the connection is up again. You can still use cloud functions, but these are optional. These are not required. So that's why we are using edge computing. Now, the big question is, can you or can we detect wastewater flow with machine learning or with artificial intelligence? Because that would be the obvious choice for most people. And to give you an idea, I just took my iPhone and uh, searched for dogs, which in German means Hund. And you can see the results over there. So on the leftmost top left, you can see uh, Farabella horse, which is a miniature horse. It was detected as a dog. Okay, it's the size of a dog, but it's definitely not a dog. I think 
Can you see that? <laughs> okay. You might see it even from a distance that it's not a dog. And in the top uh, center, you can see my mother with a teddy bear. I can think even if it's a small photo, you can still see that this is not a dog, but a teddy bear. So this is also a failure. On the right, top right, you can see a dog, definitely. Uh, then the picture number four is my, I think my daughter with a dog. Okay, then another dog, okay. Then there are a group of people at the airport. And there's no dog at all. So I wondered why has a dog been recognized? And it turns out that there's a poster in the background and there's a word hundreds in English and it starts with H-U-N-D. So the iPhone has found a dog there. Okay, you can argue about that, whether that's correct or not. Then there's another dog and another dog. And then there's a fox, and you could discuss whether a fox is a, actually a dog or not. So that's the kind of results that you get with machine learning. In this case, it's a most current iOS. Apple is a leading company and whatever, so it's a wonderful software system, and I think it's very admirable. But still, if you have nine hits and at least two of them are absolutely questionable and two others are to be discussed, and that's not the kind of path that we would want to go with the wastewater and it would not be something that the customer would accept in this case. So um, any machine learning system, as you can see on the left, uh, works with training data and has to have annotated data and it creates some kind of model that associates patterns. And these training data must be extensive and the distribution must be homogeneous. That's something I will explain on the next slide. For machine learning to work, the training data must reflect the universe. Universe means all the data. And if they do, as you can see on the leftmost box, so if the, um, if the training data is a correct subset which represents the whole uh, universe, then everything is fine and you can work with it. However, in the middle, you can see a box where you have a certain subset and it looks violet with a little green, but all in all, there's much more green and also there's yellow, which has not been detected at all. So in this case, the training data would not be re representative of the universe and then it will simply not work. It cannot work. It's impossible to work in that case. And very often results are mixed, as you can see on the right side. Uh, you have a subset or you have training data that somehow reflects the universe, but mm, a bit or not. So that's like the fox in the photo collection. It's a bit of a dog, but it's not really a dog. And of course, it uh, creates quite a challenge for wastewater detection. Now, what can we do to fix that? So if you have uh, seen my CV, I have had been working in the medical industry with heart pacemakers. An ECG looks at first sight, it looks completely different, but also there is a flow and the ECG reflects activity of the heart. And people that are experts in this area, they don't just look at the ECG, they understand biology and they understand medicine. And this knowledge turns out to be very important and to be very relevant. And I just noticed it's, uh, the heart is also a pump, so in some way it's also pump monitoring, but <laughs> that's just uh, uh, another note. Okay, so with the wastewater pumps, there's also knowledge about wastewater. And of course, the sensors reflect the wastewater flow and it changes with temperature, for example, or with the diameter of the pipe and all these things. So real world experience does count and artificial intelligence does not replace the human knowledge. It does help, but it doesn't replace it. Now, in order to make, to, to create a real time detection of the wastewater flow, we have to have real-time signal processing, in this case with Zephyr RTOS, so real-time operating system, that is a great match. We have to do the pattern recognition as early as possible to make sure that it works in time and that there is never a delay, so we should never run out of time for the processing. It must be fast enough to always catch up with the sensor data stream. And uh, we need to use an adequate resolution. A higher resolution is not necessarily better. Then 
something which is different from uh, from the traditional artificial artificial intelligence is with our system that traditional AI is a black box. You cannot uh, follow why you cannot trace or debug it usually, at, at least not at a, as a user. So I cannot ask Siri, well, is a fox really a dog? And why did you think that the teddy bear is a dog? That's a question that is that you're not supposed to ask and the system is not capable of responding to that. So maybe for, there's a developer version of that, but for normal users, it doesn't work. So, and in fact, in most cases, people don't know why there are some strange results of the AI and usually the response is, okay, we have no, to take more training data, but that's not satisfactory. So in our case, we have a system that can provide automatic explanations because there are certain rules for filtering and a logic of conclusions that can be traced. And on the right side, you can see an example of such an explanation which has been generated automatically. So if there is a conclusion that there is a, um, a, a blockage or a, a proper, uh, proper handling of the um, a pumping process, then it can explain uh, it's uh, rational. So it can explain the pump duration is longer than 10 seconds, uh, there is no long interruption, and there is always a certain pressure. And that way one can check whether the logic is correct or not. Okay, to summarize, uh, signal processing is hard. It's, there are no shortcuts. If you want to do a good signal processing system, you need years of experience, sometimes decades. So in the automotive industry or in the medical industry, they are usually people who have decades of experience. And excellent algorithms are precise and fast, and then they are really good, but it's not easy to do. And the reason why it's not easy to do is that domain knowledge is also relevant. So you have to know your prof uh, profession and you need to know if you work in the automotive area, you need to know cars, if you work with wastewater, you need to have some understanding of pumps and of the situation on site. And artificial intelligence can help to build, build a knowledge base and it can help a lot, but for itself it's not sufficient. Okay, that's from my part and then I'll hand over to Jonas. Yep. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will present the Zephyr application that, you, that we developed for the pump monitor. And first, I'll start with an overview of the hardware and the firmware. Next, I'll give an uh, introduction or explain how we use power management and what we have learned from the project. So first of all, what is the scope of the application? First, we need to read NFC tags. The NFC tags are connected to the tanks and um, they give us a representation of which tank has been emptied right now. Um, yeah. uh, second, um, we need to monitor pump, um, pump pressure, uh, pressure samples. So we, we sample these pressure samples and later we create a report from it. Three, we need to provide direct user feedback that if, in case there's any failure, sometimes the, the operator, the user can do something about it. And then we want direct feedback. We give that via an LED bar. Um, four, evaluate pressure gradient and generate the report. At the end of the um, pumping process, we generate that report and then we send it to an MQTT broker via LTEM. In this picture, you can see the block diagram of the application, like most of the components. Um, we have different components and they're connected via different um, interfaces. We use, for example, I2C, SPI and analog. But what is more important for us when we, when we thought about the application and how it needs to work is how much the power usage of each device is. Like to give you an understanding, um, there is for example the accelerometer which uh, runs with uh, 1.8 to 3.3 volts, so it's quite flexible and it consumes around five microamps in operation. So it's really low. On the other side of the spectrum, there is the NXP pressure sensor which runs on 5 volt and it consumes 7 milliampere in operation. So that's a factor of more than 1000 and if you only run the accelerometer, you can run the system for more than 10 years and if you have the pressure sensor continuously on, it's the battery is empty after a few days. 
So there is a, a great dynamic, and you can see this in many low-power applications. So that means you need to have some measure to switch off the devices which consume a lot of power. And this can be done via power gating, like you have a um, power switch or a transistor, a MOSFET transistor, which switches off the actual operating voltage. And the LED controller, the micro SD card, and the pressure sensor are power gated. So in the firmware, we can switch them off when we don't need them. Um, here on this slide, I'll explain um, which modules we, we used to meet the specification. And there were some trade-offs to make. So first of all, we use an RTOS, so we can use threads, work queues, and the timer API, for example. And those help in, in making develop, de the development easier. Um, we use sensor, LEDs, and storage APIs. For example, we have an SD card where we monitor the samples, the pressure samples, in, in a raw data format. Um, so that we can analyze them later in an, in an offline mode. Um, in case we don't have a network reception, then this data can help later to, to learn from the field test. Um, then we use the NRF Connect SDK, because we use uh, NRF 9160. Um, and in the SDK, there's, of course, modem support for the NRF 9160 for LTE, M, and NBIUT stack. Um, and in addition, the SDK also includes a driver for the NFC reader that we use. Um, then we use MQTT and JSON. And yes, there are more efficient formats like um, lightweight M2M, for example. But we made the choice to use MQTT because it was easier to develop for our application. And there is a bigger flexibility when you choose cloud providers like MQTT brokers. There is a big, a big choice. And um, lightweight M2M also has some choice nowadays. Um, but, but still, this was the easier solution. And this. Uh, it was easier to meet the timeline and the, the requirements. Um, yeah, and then we used the power management subsystem from Zephyr to switch off the devices when we don't need them. So the system has three main states. Uh, first is the sleep mode. Um, most of the time, the system resides in sleep mode. When the accelerometer detects an acceleration above a threshold, then an interrupt is generated, and the system switches to sensing mode. This will last for around 120 seconds. And in this, sending, uh, in this sensing mode, we continuously pull the NFC reader, and we take pressure samples every two seconds. And usually, a pump monitoring is started when you hold the, the uh, plumbing to the tank, and the NFC uh, tag is red. But in some cases, when an NFC tag is, for example, missing, then we want to still have the option to just start the pump monitoring when the pressure is also below a threshold. So then it's automatically started. Um, the pressure sampling frequency is 50 hertz. And most of the energy is consumed in pump monitoring. So that means the power management works and the sleep mode is actually quite low power. And most of the energy is consumed by pulling the NFC tag, reading uh, pressure, and signaling via the LEDs. Here you can see the PCB connected to a Nordic Power Profiler Kit. And the Power Profiler Kit supplies the PCB. And at the same time, it measures the current so that you can see the dynamic current flow of the system. And in this diagram, you can see an interval of two seconds. And in this two seconds, we take, uh, I mean, we take every two seconds one pressure sample. And you can see this uh, relatively high peak of, of current flow represents the switch on time of the pressure sensor. So we switch, switch it on for a short time. We have this peak current. And then after we take the samples, we switch it off. Next, when we zoom in, we see now the individual um, polling of the NFC reader. This is an interval of 100 milliseconds. And that was also a, a decision from the requirement we needed a good responsiveness of the system. The system should just work. And if the user will hold the, the plumbing to the tag, it should immediately recognize the NFC tag. Um, that's why we made that trade-off to, uh, to, to pull it in a relatively high frequency of 10 hertz, even though that consumes more energy. Um, here, again, we zoom a little bit in. And now we have an interval of 20 milliseconds. This represents our 50 hertz pressure sample, uh, sampling. And you can see here the, when we, the, amount, the time when we take a pressure sample um, 
the energy is, is very low. It's just a little CPU time and reading one or a few analog samples. In this case, the pressure sensor needs to be always on. It has a warm-up time of 20 milliseconds. So in this case, when we pressure up at 50 hertz, we just keep it on. And you can make two categorization here. Um, cheap energy, I mean, cheap and expensive devices to run in terms of energy. And in our, in our example, in our system, cheap is CPU time, taking temperature humidity sensor samples or accelerometer samples. And those sensors are all very optimized and they don't consume much energy. On the other side, you have expensive things like radio, pressure sensor, NFC reader, and LED. They consume a lot of current and we need to switch them off if, uh, if we can. So from that example, you can also take that edge computing use case in this in our, in our case, makes sense because we have CPU time, we can use them. It doesn't consume too much energy. At the same time, if you would send the raw data to the cloud, we always would need to keep the radio on or at much larger intervals. So that would ultimately consume much more energy. And this is the case in, in many systems, like radio time is, is always expensive. So what are the issues, or what can be the issues when we just switch off devices, when we just unplug them from power? In case of the, acceler of the analog pressure sensor, it doesn't matter. It's an analog and purely analog sensor, and it doesn't need initialization. So we can just switch it off. When we switch it on again, we just need to wait 20 milliseconds, warm up time, and then we can take samples anytime. For the uh, TI LED controller, for example, um, we need to initialize it after we switch it on. There is one uh, register uh, chip enable, and this chip enable register needs to be switched on um, after power up via SQRC. So in Zephyr, you can do this via power management, and you see on the, um, on the right side uh, part of the implementation of the driver, and inside the device driver, there is uh, a function um, device action resume where it calls uh, LP5569 enable. So it calls a function to enable the device. And this is automatically executed from the power management when we switch on a regulator. A regulator is a concept in Zephyr where you can control, um, control voltages. And yeah, that, that saves some, some effort and Zephyr takes the, takes the work in our case. Then some important design decisions in our project. Um, of course, power gating versus always on. It's a trade-off and you, you have to check each device individually if you want to keep it on or if you have to switch it off or maybe uh, set it to power, uh, power saving mode. Um, in our case, the LP5569 had some other problems that it was connected uh, via cabling as in a separate module. And sometimes it can happen that these cables are not reliable, especially during shock conditions. You might have yeah, a very brief disconnect. So if we have this hot plugging capability anyway, if we initialize the device anyway after power up, then these rare incidences, it doesn't matter anymore. And we just reinitialize the device and we're good to go again. Um, then the five volt requirement for the pressure sensor is actually a disadvantage, but we chose that sensor because it was a, a very robust solution and the robustness was more important for the system. Then, as I explained already, the MQTT versus uh, lightweight M2M decision. We went for uh, MQTT because it was easier for us to develop and the energy impact or the energy disadvantage of, of MQTT in combination with TCP um, was still low compared to the other devices. Um, then we had the decision to, uh, to store the samples on an SD card. And this was, it would usually be not required um, because we can send the, the data via, or the result via network, via LTEM. But in the beginning, we did not know the state of the network. Um, Some time back, the network was, was in, the, in, the, in the process of, uh, of building up in Germany or in Europe. And we were not exactly sure how, how good it was at that time. So we wanted to have the option to, to store that data locally that later we can, we can take it from the device if needed. What have we learned from the project? Um, first, develop features in application modules. Like you can, with Zephyr, very easily you can separate software modules. And 
test features individually, test devices individually, and then later connect everything and integrate it with each other. Um, the mode of, of the way how we worked, um, for hardware we did a specification, like we knew what we wanted, um, and for software it was more like a rapid prototyping approach because some parts of the requirements have not been known at the start of the project and we needed to, to figure out how to best um, take these samples and, and what exactly, what, what data exactly we need to see, we need to sample. Um, for example, some, some examples for that. Um, the NFC tag format was initially not, not very well specified and there were some, some try and error to, to take, to, to, yeah, to read many tags and then to identify what, what data is on them and how reliable is this data. And for example, um, there were two options on how to start, how to move from sensing to pump monitoring. First to take a, uh, to read an NFC tag successfully or to start the pumping process by detecting an under pressure, a low pressure. And this was also a requirement was, which was not there at the beginning. So we changed our strategy in the middle and also went for option B that we have the second option to activate the monitoring. Uh, then the field test with a limited number of devices. It's a great opportunity to learn and I think for most projects you will not get around that. You, you need that. You need a field test, you need to make your experiences and then optimize the system. Um, yeah, one takes also LTE and that looks reliable. We had very little issues with it and on, on nearly all sides we could continuously get a network connection and send the data that we required. Then some notes from the operations. Operations means um, the phase while the, the field test was deployed and while the sensors were in the field. Um, for, for debugging purposes, we just stored all the MQTT messages in an SQL database. That's a very easy way of, of uh, filtering them later at any time and finding issues with it, comparing results, comparing temperature and humidity. Um, to have some data, we took daily telemetry statistics and those included humidity and temperature. Then the wake-up cycles, how many times the system switched from um, sleep mode to sensing mode and to pump mode. We wanted to know this information. And ultimately the active time, which was important to calculate how much energy we need for the project, how many pump emptying processes are there daily. Um, yeah, And one interesting um, feature which we also later implemented was water intrusion alarm. Like we have an humidity sensor in the housing. So in case the housing, the ceiling has an issue, there was heavy rain or, or the housing is broken in, in other ways and water is, is uh, inside the housing, then we can detect this early and we can detect it before the electronic breaks. Like maybe there are some days or, or so, but if water is for some days in the, in the housing and electronics, then this will, this will surely harm it. Um, yeah, quickly, what's next? Um, we have, uh, there are plans to increase the battery life and we are confident that we can reach a battery life of more than one year. Um, for that, we probably need to remove the five volt requirement to make the power management more efficient. And for that, we need to change the pressure sensor. Um, then the capacitive NFC detection can be optimized. Um, the NFC reader has two ways of detecting an attacks, either via inductive or via capacitive sensing. Um, then the cloud to device communication that we can, from the cloud, from the MQTT broker, we can send small, small data, small, uh, small data, for example, to set the lock level in the hardware. That um, initially, when you deploy a new firmware version, you might want to have a, a high lock level, and afterwards you can we can reduce that. And we need firmware over the air update for the app and the modem firmware of the device. Yeah. So that's it. Do you have a question? My question is, uh, if you have a, 
if you have ever thought about adding any simple button, uh, such as wake me up button to reading the NFCs, um, it may improve the power efficiency. You want to answer? Um, uh, you, uh, you asked about the NFC reader specifically? Or, okay, so NFC reader is, um, is read only in a situation when the module is very near to the railway tank. It doesn't need to pull permanently because that would use a lot of energy. But if the system is turned on because and it can detect that it's turned on with the accelerometer, then it wakes up. And if it's near to the railway, then it will uh, pull the NFC reader. But, uh, and that's 10 times a second, which is relatively fast. So if you move it, then you will not notice. It's li just like uh, paying with a credit card. It's NFC, near field communication. So if you detect it 10 times a second, then you will not notice a delay. But if you do it 100 times per second, then it would waste a lot of energy. And if you have it two times a second, you would notice a delay. So I think adding a button would be easier technically, but um, this is like a user interface problem. Like the user doesn't want to press a button or he might forget it or so. And then it's, it's easier to have the system automatic. All right, I have a question about the data collection because while well, you can you know, make the sensors and all that, how did you go about establishing the truth? So you know, sitting in the rail yard and recording raw readings of all sensors for a week or for some period, or how did you get the truth? You know, some workers saying this one is blocked, this one is not because they've been doing that for 20 years or something like that. We spend a lot of time together uh, at the railway stations. So, and it was uh, several weeks and we learned a lot from the people who uh, did the work and that, uh, in fact, they are the real heroes because everything that is in this system in the si signal processing is something that we learned from them. Okay. You mentioned that uh, the most power consuming uh, parts are the NFC and the data communication or that data transferring. So um, what is the frequency of transferring data or is it um, acceptable for the, in this case customer to have the intervals be a uh, frequency be lower so that you only every I don't know, day or so have to transfer data. I mean data itself doesn't change right the volume but maybe the polling or the mm. frequency can be lower to save energy. Yeah, that's true. And that is like, for example, we have this interval where we send statistics once a day and we can vary that. There is no problem about it. But when we measure a pump emptying process, Deutsche Bahn or the, the customer wants to have this immediately, this data, because the train is in the maintenance station and um, it has maybe 10 tank connections and Deutsche Bahn wants to make sure that all of them could be emptied successfully. And if not, then five minutes later, they could take some actions. They could like connect a stronger pump or I mean there might some measures and they can take a learning from it so they want to have that data immediately immediately. Okay. We have one minute left. So All right. you said there is a second mechanism for starting the monitoring process, right? So when there is no NFC? Uh, yes, right. Yes, uh, that's based on the pressure, right? Yep. Uh, but in this case how do you know that this is uh, the train is uh, standing near the uh, pumping station or you know, what, what's a trigger for uh, starting this monitoring process if there is no NFC available? Because you know, when the train is speeding up, um, and the pressure actually changes. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm wondering how do you differentiate between uh, um, you know, train standing near the pumping station versus uh, the pressure change because the train is moving? Um, well, we know that the user has taken the system out of the, the holder because of the accelerometer has triggered. Um, and the second thing, once then the, the pressure changes, uh, then we know that the pump has been has been on and something is connected to the to the plumbing and then only the pressure changes if the plumbing is open the pressure will not go below that threshold so if there's liquid flowing then there's always movement and there's always some kind of waves and that's a distinctive pattern that we can recognize so if you want uh, if you would like to know more details about that you can send me an email and i can send you a detailed description from that. Okay. So uh, just real quick, there's there is one question on the chat. Uh, I'm not sure of the context here, but they asked, 
why not shut down temp and humidity sensors as well? It came in during the, the middle of it. Yeah. yeah, we can do that, but it's not required because they're already very low power. TI has designed them like that. They can be in a, in a sleek mode and they consume, I think, less than one microampere. So it, it doesn't bring a significant benefit to switch them off. Very good. And with that, we actually reached the end of our time here. Um, like to oof, stop. Like to thank our uh, speakers, and I think uh, you'll also engage online with the chats afterwards as well. So, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.